Welcome, everyone. Okay, so uh, yeah, thanks again. Um, hi again. Thanks again for 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 joining our our lecture of our class. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. So today I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start a second lecture. But before before I start, so um, of course feel free to interrupt uh, if you wanna wanna ask a question. Maybe it's best that you just uh, use your camera. You know, uh, turn on your camera and ask the question directly. I'll be also monitoring the chat, but uh, I prefer if you can ask questions um, directly. So today we are going to really start from the almost like the very beginning, uh, and we are going to um, uh, maybe discuss neural networks by the second part of the lecture. But uh, the first, what I wanted to do first is to give you a, maybe more like a formal overview or like a description of what we are planning to to do. Right? What what does it mean to to do supervised learning and what are the kind of the key mathematical questions. And also, uh, I forgot to say, my plan is to take a break uh, somewhere uh, by mid of the lecture. Uh, so we are going to take maybe like a 15 minute break and we can just informally discuss here. And uh, et cetera, right? so I'm planning to take a break in an hour or so. All right. So um, let me just then jump straight ahead. So we are going to start by describing the basic uh, supervised learning setup. And let me also say that the, most of the contents of today's lecture, you can find it in the books by uh, Francis Juan, uh, and also this very nice uh, lecture note by Matus Telgarski. Um, I guess it is on the deep learning theory. Uh, all right, so let's start with the supervised learning setup. So the, the, the problem starts with someone gives you some data that in the supervised case, data has two flavors, right? So one is the, what we call the input and this, what, what, that's what we call the label. So think that uh, if you think about a, a classification problem, XI would be the image and YI would be whether there's a cat or not. And so I have n of these examples, uh, and one of the distinctive features here is that xi is going to belong to a high-dimensional space. More about that later. And then yi, as I said, there are going to be some labels. And so what we want is that given the so basically the goal is that given this data, we want to estimate a mapping that goes from the input space, to the label space, that knowing this goal, uh, just writing it very informally, you would like it to generalize us to unseen data. Okay, so here there's Two, you know, two aspects that uh, one could wonder what they mean is like first, what does it mean to generalize, and what does it mean? I mean, how do you formalize this idea that there's a some setup where you have some data, and then uh, someone tells you about something that will happen in the future, right? So who knows what's going to happen in the future? And so, to but uh, but at, at that context, this should not uh, feel very different from the problem where uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, observe some signal in some points, right? Uh, you observe something here and you want to extend it to the rest of the domain. So one can think about this as some kind of a, a glorified interpolation. Of course, the, 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 key, the, the key difference from this maybe uh, this view and what is like the bulk of the of the class is that you should think about these points almost as being like the the stars in the in the in the in the universe right so the you know every point is very 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 far from anything else right and and there's really this idea that this is really like a consequence or like a you know uh, like a like the the new mathematical content is really coming from the fact 
that these problems really live in high dimension, right? And, and so the whole mathematical quest is understanding the impact of high dimensionality in these, uh, you know, let's say classic statistical problems. So to, to go beyond the, it's like the, so, so the, the starting point of any, any learning theory is uh, what we call this IAD assumption, right? So the IAD assumption is that data is from IAD from some underlying distribution, right? From, um, from a distribution Uh, that lives on the product space. Okay, and then um, so so this in a sense formalizes the this idea of unseen, right? So we want to, you know, we have we observe some samples from this distribution, and then we want to do something that works well in the future. So how do we uh, how do we measure how do we evaluate the quality of a of a model? So we have a we introduce a point-wise kind of quality metric or loss. That is just a, some uh, function that just lives in the space of labels. Think about this, that is just like a, some cost function, right? And, and as an example, uh, we can think about the logistic loss if we are doing a classification. Or we can think, um, in terms of the square loss, if we are thinking about regression. Okay, so in the case of regression, here, this space of labels can be uh, you know, plus minus one. And here you can think that y is just um, r, right? If we are thinking about regression. Okay, so um, given uh, then with these loss, so given uh, um, any, um, any estimate or any function f, we can, uh, we can use these, uh, already these ingredients to define to the rest of these defines the population risk. which is just the expectation for the data of the loss. Of course, uh, because this is a quantity that we cannot manipulate, right? We, we don't have access to this uh, uh, distribution. Um, we have the empirical version, which typically we denote by R hat which is just an average, we replace this expectation by the empirical expectation. The same thing. Right? And of course you can uh, verify um, instantaneously that if you take the expectation of the, of the empirical loss, you get the population loss, right? So uh, you can think about this as an unbiased Estimator of the risk. Okay, and so at this point, the, uh, this is just, uh, I guess, by everyone uh, should be very familiar. We are just introducing these uh, functions, and these functions are hopefully going to guide us through the selection of the right function, right? The, the right mapping to interpolate the data in a way that we want. And so, um, of course, we the algorithm needs to select the best hypothesis, right? And, and, and it's selected within some space of hypothesis, right? So we introduce, we define something that is called a hypothesis space. That we can write this capital F, which is just a collection of functions that go from the input to the output. Okay, so this is really, a, this is our kind of universe of uh, functions that we can stretch over. And so um, to, to really make a progress, like to, to say something that is statistically meaningful, we need to quantify this hypothesis space a little bit. And for this, we assume 
that f comes with a norm, right? A norm, I mean, technically, in what we're going to say today, the fact that it's a, you know, verifies the axioms of a norm is not that important, but it's what is important is the fact that it's a, it's a quantity that we can use to organize hypotheses in our space amongst the hypotheses that are small versus hypotheses that are big. So here, think, think about really like that the, this space of hypotheses has a norm. And so what it means is that we can assign to each hypothesis a complexity measure. So in particular, this defines uh, the, the, you know, that, that if, if you think about uh, in a picture, you might have your all hypothesis space and the hypothesis space might have uh, this kind of onion kind of structure, right? So you have a very simple hypothesis that is in the center and then you have a hypothesis that are more and more complex. Right, and so we 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 find this space, this thing, these balls, are the, the the functions in my hypothesis that have complexity that is bounded by some radius delta. Okay, and so just to give some examples, um, this could be uh, the. Um, The norms over the neural network parameter weights. So I don't remember if Sebastia last uh, on Tuesday described, you know, introduced the uh, neural network architecture. But if you have like a bunch of uh, weight matrices that connect uh, one layer to the next, you could imagine taking the norm of these matrices and declaring that this is your measure of complexity. It could be also the number of neurons of an architecture. Why not? Or it could be if if you have if we have here people who are a bit more um, uh, used and familiar with uh, you know this problem, it could also be let's say the number of gradient steps um, for models. F uh, reached by each gradient step, like the number of gradient steps uh, for models F uh, using gradient steps. In the sense that this notion of complexity can, can also have the algorithm, the learning algorithm incorporated inside, right? So imagine that uh, any procedure might, might start here in the center. And so if I take uh, many, many gradient steps, I may be able to reach for more complicated functions that if I use less number of gradient steps. That could be one example. OK, so these are uh, just the basic ingredients. And, and please uh, let me know um, if there's any question. Uh, as I insist, um, I, I, don't, I, don't, you know, I don't have a good calibration of uh, whether what I'm saying <clears throat> is familiar to everyone or not. But uh, I guess ah, I have a question here. Good. Uh, Sebastian, can you maybe um, monitor the chat if, if, or someone is around because uh, I may not see the chat all the time. Okay, there's a question from uh, Juan Jimeno that says, maybe do you wanna do you wanna unmute yourself and ask the question so that maybe we can start to I can start to map names to faces. Okay, well anyway. So um, yeah, what is the basics with the non-supervised? So non-supervised, uh, unsupervised learning is a different procedure that, um, yeah, um, has different goal, right? So the goal is on supervised learning is to estimate some like mapping that goes from this very high dimensional space to some labels. In unsupervised learning, the, you might have a different goal. Your goal might be to uh, let's say organize the data, right? Maybe discover some dimensions of the data that uh, you know that have some different meaning, special meaning, and this is not not always very well defined, right? So so it could also be, can I can from these um, 
like the observer data that they observe, can I estimate a density, a probability density, right? If I believe that my data points came from an underlying distribution, can I estimate the data distribution? That's an example of a setting that would have an unsupervised flavor. So yeah, we are not gonna uh, discuss about this in this course, but uh, uh, you, you, can, you can think that many of the objects that we are gonna be talking about today and in the later lectures, uh, of course they translate, they extend to some of these problems of density estimation and uh, et cetera. So um, that's a, yeah, it's, it's an important distinction. All right. So now we are gonna uh, introduce, uh, describe like the most elementary learning algorithm, like a, a you know, like a, um, let's say, yeah, like a, some, some procedure, algorithmic procedure to, to solve, like to, you know, to estimate these functions, which, is, which goes by the name of the empirical disk. Okay, and so in words, before going to the definition, it, it does something very simple. It's just that we search for a small empirical risk using small complexity. All right. So just uh, in uh, you know in a picture, sometimes it's easier to understand than, than the definition. Uh, remember, like this picture I have above of this uh, hypothesis space alongside with these balls. So now I'm gonna I'm, I can plot, let's say, the level sets right of my uh, empirical risk. Right. So these are like the functions right where the empirical risk is small. Right. Let's say zero. Imagine. Right? So these are like all the hypotheses in my, in my world that fit very well with the data. So the idea of ERM is very simple. The idea of ERM is to try to identify these kind of solutions, right? Solutions that have a good compromise between explaining well the data while having small complexity, pretty natural. And so this can be uh, articulated uh, you know, using different programs. Uh, you can think about what we call the constraint form, which tries to just look for hypotheses in this ball of the empirical risk. So you just try to minimize empirical risk over this constraint set. Of course, you can uh, turn this into, um, I believe that Sebastian described a little bit about the uh, Lagrange multipliers on, on Tuesday. So you can uh, think about this if you want in a penalized form. Uh, by introducing a Lagrange multiplier. And here I'm just gonna, so this is the Lagrange multiplier. Or even more, more popular these days, you can also um, Yeah, and we can also uh, uh, introduce, we can also uh, do empirical risk minimization in what we call the interpolation for interpolation for. Okay, so here we we, we just uh, trying to minimize the complexity, subject to the to the fact that our hypothesis fits the data perfectly, right? So this is in the situations. with no noise, right? So this is the constraint, penalized or interpolized. Okay, so the interpolined form is uh, popular these days in particular, you can think about this in situations where your hypothesis space is very powerful, right? You have so many parameters in your class that you can, you can fit uh, all the training examples, right? So every time that you have an example that you feed, right? F of xi equals yi, you have an equation, right? So you have a system of n equations. So if you have more degrees of freedom than equations, a priori, you could uh, feed the data, right? Uh, of course, these equations are gonna be nonlinear in general, but assuming that you can find a solution, that would be an interpolant solution. So 
which one should you choose amongst all the solutions that fit the data? You're gonna choose the one that has smallest complexity. I have a question from uh, Latif. Do you mind uh, um, turning on your camera and asking it? No? Okay, so uh, Latif is asking if you can, ah, okay, wait a second, good. Well, maybe I can keep keep going, and then um, uh, we can we can pause. We can you can ask the question. All right. So now we are. Um, we know what we want to do, and so now we are going to see um, uh, how um, how to think about succeeding or not in the problem. Right. So remember that the goal was to do well and unseen data, and so we are going to try to to quantify. One understand when is when when we can when can we declare success? Okay, so for this uh, we are going to introduce a very simple decomposition. It's a basic decomposition. That this will allow us to think a little to think really about the problem and what do we need to succeed. And so. We, we again, we can assume that let some hypothesis that we have found that has some limited complexity, finite complexity, F delta. Okay, produced by an arbitrary algorithm. Okay, so then we want to understand, we want we want to understand how well does this algorithm do? So what is the population loss? And we want to maybe understand how well does it does relative to the best we could have done a posteriori, right? So if we had like some uh, very powerful model that could look not at the uh, empirical data, but at all the data, right? So if you have like some very powerful Oracle that would just give you the best uh, hypothesis, best risk in the in the whole space. You want to understand this difference, and so for this we are just gonna you know um, we are we are just gonna um, add and subtract a few terms just to isolate the terms that we care about. So the first thing that we can add and subtract is the best we could have we could have done, but taking into account the complexity, right? So we are gonna uh, add and subtract the best. And I was maybe uh, like this. I don't know if that's gonna work. So we can do two like that. Doesn't matter. Okay. And no delta of the risk, and then I just add it again. Right? And we can already interpret what is this term saying, right? So this term is, is measuring the difference between uh, explaining like the function, like the, the difference between the best we could do in all the domain versus the best we could do by just restricting the complexity. Okay, so this is a, something that has a flavor of an approximation error. So those of you who are familiar, who have done, you know, approximation theory, or you know, in general, when you think about uh, approximating a function or an image in a basis, what we want is to try to, to, you know, to consume the least amount of resources to get the best possible approximation error. So here, the notion of resources is delta, right? Is how many, you know, how many neurons, or how, you know, how large are the weights that you're going to use. Okay, so now we can keep going, and we can again um, uh, decompose again by um, trying to uh, make apparent the algorithmic aspect of the problem. So we might want to add and subtract something that has to do with the function, right? The, uh, the algorithm, of course, here only sees our hat, right? 
by, by definition, um, any algorithm is only going to be able to use the data that you give him, right? It cannot, it cannot cheat. Okay, so we are going to add and subtract this quantity minus the empirical loss at the point. And I'm going to add again minus the umph over, and I'm going to add and subtract also in the case where I'm optimizing, right? So the best. ERM model, and then I need to carry the terms that I have added, right? So it's the alpha delta, delta right? minus the alpha in F delta of R. Okay. Plus the approximation error. Let's call this okay. So this is, is an equality at this point. Okay, and so now we can uh, uh, we we have a new term here that we introduce that, that appears that is also pretty natural. That is this term here. Okay, which is uh, in words uh, penalizing us for not finding the smallest empirical risk in the ball. Okay, so this has a flavor of optimization, right? Because, uh, for example, if we were able to solve this problem. C completely, right? If we were able, if we were able to return this problem, this solution, this error would be zero, right? So this is the optimization error. Okay, so this is penalizing us from not being able to solve the error. And now we are left with two other terms, right? Um, that we can write in different color. This term here, and this term here, and these terms are really, when you, when you stare at them, they are really uh, capturing the fluctuations, like the difference between using, like the, they were paying for using the wrong function, right? So, so uh, when, when the empirical version of the risk is very different from the population version of the risk, these terms are gonna be large, right? So in, in other words, when we are, so if we're able to control how these two functions fluctuate one from each other, we can control these terms. And very naturally, you can, uh, you know, because this is a, min a minimization, right? Uh, you can take here from this point, we can, uh, we can of course, upper bound this thing by r hat of, let's call it f, let's call it f, uh, you know, f bar minus r of f bar, right? Where f bar is the arc mean of r of f, right in f delta. And so what we see is that this is actually smaller than two times let's like look at this the largest fluctuation right we can just uh, pack everything into this soup and we just look at the um, largest deviation between uh, the empirical version and the population version and then we have uh, the approximation error plus the optimization okay and so uh, by completing the analogy what is this term about so this term is a term that has to do with statistics, right? Like uh, how these two functions uh, fluctuate, right? So this is a, what we call like a statistical error. Okay, so, um, so what, 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 what are we staring at here, right? We have uh, basically now three terms, right? Like uh, we have uh, three sources of error. We have the approximation error, which is a, a, you know, approximation error, which um, we wrote as the difference between these two risks. And if you simplify, so if you simplify, uh, let's say in the regression case, um, so in regression, if you think that this R of F it's some kind of like a distance between uh, f and a ground truth function with some measure. That's just to help you think about uh, how that, what does this approximation error look like? What we are asking is that, um, we're asking that uh, 
what the the approximation you want to approximate this target function f star, right? Which is kind of the, the ground truth. Okay, so this would be the case where you have data that has this form with y equals some target function. Okay. So if you are in this setting, uh, what does the approximation error look like? So the approximation error look like is you you want to you want to um, understand how does this error depend on delta, right? Okay, so that's the approximation error. So obviously there's a, there's a one. Um, Obvious conclusion that we can take is that the approximation error uh, as delta um, increases, the approximation error uh, decreases. Okay, because we are looking for the, the best fit over a larger space. Then we have another sort of error that is the statistical error. Or the generalization error, right? Which can be, we are, I'm writing it here in the, um, in the, by just essentially looking at the uniform fluctuations over my ball. Uh, so this is the difference between uh, a hat. And just be, be mindful that this is a random quantity, right? Why is it random? Because uh, this, uh, this function is random, right? That's something that depends on the data. So as such, so this is really something that measures uniform fluctuations over the ball f. Okay, and just to, to get like some very, very, very basic intuition of what this statistical error is doing, let me just put this thing over here. Uh, here. Okay, so just to get like a very, very simple intuition, there's two main quantities that affect the, the statistical error, right? So there's um, quantities that uh, drive this error. Um, is n, right, which is the number of data points and delta, right, which is the size of, okay. So, so just to get, to get a sense, maybe also to, to maybe refresh some ideas and make sure that no, no one is completely lost at this point. What is the expected behavior? So how do we expect this error to depend roughly on n and on delta. Okay, so so in other words, yeah, what is the, the expect? Right, we don't need to do anything here super precise, but just to get a sense, like to get an intuition. But hopefully, also will you know connect maybe the dots when you think about. Uh, measuring fluctuations of a random variable, and then uh, looking at the uniform fluctuation. Like this, this here we are looking at basically uh, the largest fluctuations over many events, right? So maybe just to get some intuition, you can start by fixing fix that first, right? So imagine that for a second, that your hypothesis space, your ball is just one function, one element, right? So how do you expect this fluctuation to, to grow to depend on N? Right, so in other words, we are interested in understanding 
How large are these populations? Okay, so if I, if, I, if I develop this thing, as I said, uh, the empirical error is just a, an average over data points, right, of the loss. Okay, so I can write this by applying the definition. This is nothing else than the loss of f of xi with yi minus the expectation, right, of the loss of f of x and y. And these things are IAD, right? So remember that So here we are just measuring the fluctuations of an average of independent random variables. So automatically, you get uh, kind of like a CLT behavior, if you want, right? Like a lot of large numbers that tells us that the size of these fluctuations, right, are going to be you know, driven by the standard deviation of this random variable divided by Okay, so this of course is like a back of the envelope, but uh, you know, this has two important aspects is that one is that it's non-asymptotic. Right? So we know that we can quantify these things at finite n. And then we can, uh, you know, this is of course is just uh, like uh, relying on uh, just, just measuring how the, the standard deviation behaves, but of course you can, uh, you can quantify it, right? Can be quantified in high probability by using classic tail bounds. Okay. All right. And so if I fix the fact that hypothesis, I know that I have, you know, uh, let's say a statistical error that is uh, some constant, right? That depends on just the distribution divided by square root of n. So that's, uh, I guess, very familiar for everyone who has, has always familiar with uh, you know, basic statistical inference. But then the question, of course, that the thing that makes this, this, uh, this error slightly non-standard is that now we need to not just look at the error by fixing f, but we need to control the worst possible fluctuation over our ball. Okay, so we, here we need to have some, some kind of, a, if you're familiar, I guess, with, uh, with this problem, this might remind you of, uh, you know, techniques that use the union bound, right? So you would basically want to, if you can control the probability that this deviation is large, and you know that this, this probability is small, then you can uh, use this small probability to uh, control the probability that any of the hypotheses in your ball is small, right? By using the crude or union bound. Um, so in other words, the, the, if you want to go from pointwise control, To uniform control, uh, we need to handle, uh, you know, uh, how to compute basically uh, probabilities of events that are unions of events, right? It's like, and so uh, we can use tools. So requires requires some tools from concentration. Okay, so that we can apply union bounds efficiently. Uh, and we are not gonna, I don't know if there's any plan. I don't remember uh, in, my in my mind if there's a lecture that we are dedicated to these things. Uh, it's in the article and of course it's like, there's very classical uh, references if you're interested in going that direction uh, from con concentration and then of course empirical, empirical processes. So like just to give you some some words, I mean these are like the you know you can think about rather matter averages, or like the, you know PC dimension. Th these things that maybe uh, Sebastian described in the beginning, uh, these are really at this level. But the, but at the end of the day, what what we are saying is that the conclusion, like this statistical error, right? If you want to think about it, it's gonna it's gonna look like some quantity that we can call this maybe H of delta. And of course, it depends on the function class divided by square root of one, right? That's a, that's a real good rule of thumb to think about how the statistical error grows. And so if we wanna make, uh, if we wanna ensure that this error is not gonna blow up, 
you can see that we require that the number of samples, right here, this denominator needs to be large against the numerator, right? And the numerator is some is a quantity that will essentially capture how many how many different hypotheses we can fit, we can we can have in our ball, right? So so obviously if delta increases, right? There's more and more things that we need to take the soup over, so this quantity will increase, right? So the 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 key, the key, the key, um, let's say, underlying idea to to ensure that your learning model generalizes well is to understand how large is the num numerator, of course, and how many samples do you need to compensate the growth of the numerator. All right. Uh, so, let's to, and uh, yeah, I need to find each other, right, or compensate each other. <clears throat> All right, and the last uh, the last term that, uh, that that we have in this picture is the optimization error. Okay, which is uh, which uh, as uh, as I remember it uh, it penalizes us right from uh, being able to automatically solve this optimization problem. Okay, so these measures. Solve the error. So you might ask, what, why, why cannot? What, what is hard about this problem? Well, it's hard about this problem because, uh, in as we will see uh, throughout the, the class, uh, uh, many uh, you know many situations of interest. This set here is non-convex in most practical. All right, so so we need to understand uh, how can we actually, despite this fact, is there is there a chance where we can get guarantees, right? That uh, maybe if we make you know the hypothesis space a bit larger, if we can increase delta a little bit, can we make this this optimization problem easier, right? So so this is just to say that at the end of the day we have uh, these three sources of error, that is the approximation, the statistics. And the computation, if you want, right? Each has its own, let's say, dedicated role to play in the in, a, in controlling the error. And really, the, the 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 you know, if there's one lesson from from you know from today and generally even more generally from these lectures, is that there's a there's a you know this is really like a fully connected graph, right? So there's a interactions that that really. Um, go in all directions, right? There's no way this, thing, this problem can be understood without taking all these elements into account at the same time, okay? And so, um, all right. Are there any, any questions uh, so far? This was, this was just meant to be like a very gentle, uh, you know, overview and setup um, so that at least we can, we can agree on the notation and the, the objects that we are gonna be describing. Okay, so let me continue then, and we are maybe gonna take a break in about uh, half an hour. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, to illustrate why this, uh, you know, this picture that we have here Okay, where we have all these all these like uh, uh, terms interacting, we're interested in in really uh, instantiating or like seeing how these errors behave. In particular, as we send the problem into high dimension, right? We are really interested in understanding whether these problems can scale, scale to images that have millions of pixels, or you know, uh, molecules that have a uh, you know million you know many many atoms, etc. You are really interested in understanding how these machine learning problems behave as your data becomes very, very high dimension. And so the, the underlying, basically, and the, the underlying question of this section is really how, uh, in particular, we are gonna focus 
uh, now in uh, statistics and approximation. So how do uh, approximation and statistics? Errors behave. Let's take the dimension. Okay, so that's the that's the, um, the subtype. Okay, let's start maybe from the statistics. Okay, let's look for for the statistics. Okay, and there's many ways where you can formulate this problem. Um, Again, uh, let me just uh, assume again a regression setting with no noise. So assume that we observe xi with some unknown function f star of xi. And let me just, uh, for fixing ideas in this section, doesn't really matter, but just assume that data is Gaussian. Okay, so the data is in the xi are in dimension d. Okay, and, and so f star is unknown. So now we are really in the business of the question I ask, right? It's a, it's a classical question in statistics. That is how many samples are needed. to estimate F star up to accuracy. Okay, so we want just the, you know, the let's, let's say that we just fix something very simple, um, loss function, right? Which is just like a mean square error, if you want. So this is what's called, uh, you know, in statistical terms, and you might be familiar, it's called the sample complexity. Okay, so these are, of course, is a very, uh, this question is not very, it's not well defined because I didn't tell you anything about F star, right? So if F star is arbitrary, this question makes no sense. Um, so, we need to make assumptions on F star, right? So let's start with a very simple assumption. You know, maybe the simplest one could make is that suppose for us that F star, I'm gonna make the life very easy for you, right? That uh, F star is linear. So F star of X is just uh, <coughs> um, of this form, right? For some unknown theta star. Right, that is an unknown direction. So if I know that, I would, I will, I would, I'd better adapt my hypothesis space to leverage this knowledge, right? So what would be my natural hypothesis space to leverage, you know, what I know about F star, right? So I don't need to look for arbitrary functions. I just need to look for linear functions, right? So I can just, uh, you know, focus on trying to fit functions that are of this form. Right. So of course, the the linear, you know, the the linear forms in RDE are, you know, by the Ries theorem. It is, you know, you can think about the the dimensionality of that class of the linear class is in fact isomorphic to the space itself. Right. It's like I have, you know, the the parameter that I need to learn is just the direction. Okay. So I guess that uh, you know some people here, those that are following might know, right? So how many samples do I need to, to, you know, to learn F star? Yeah, there's really, the, the setup is the simplest it can be, right? There's no noise, there's nothing. Any, any, any guesses? And do you think it's a regression? Good. Okay. So, so how many? So, do you think that uh, that you need, uh, let's say, one, two, or something that depends somehow on the parameter of the problem? 
Right. I mean, the, the answer is, I mean, I think it's already good, right? Is that, um, of course, because here, good, very good, right? It's a dimension of H, of course, and the answer is that N equal D uh, sufficient for exact recovery. And in fact, obviously they are also necessary, right? In the sense that if I have less than D, uh, I have less equations than unknowns, right? So there's no way I can estimate the parameter, right? So are sufficient and necessary. Um, and indeed, you just solve a system that is like Xi with omega has to be the same as Xi with omega star, right? Right, uh, equals one to D. All right. There's a remark that I find quite interesting and it already help, tells you that, um, I mean, these problems are, are kind of rich with, uh, you know, like the, the, these problems are actually quite, quite rich with structure is that let me now make the problem slightly more interesting for you. So instead of asking this function to be linear, now I'm gonna just pass this uh, dot product to a nonlinear function. Okay, and let me just uh, say that, you know, this is like, a, it's an even function. And that is, let's say smooth. For example, think that the uh, phi of C would be the absolute value. Right? Or maybe some uh, you know cosine of t, something like this. Right? So now you might ask the question, okay, now I make the problem a little bit harder, right? So um, uh, maybe I don't, maybe you know, uh, these samples are no longer necessary, uh, sufficient, because uh, you know, this, this activation function is again uh, losing some information, right? I have maybe less. You know less information if you want in the in the measurements. So in fact, it's uh, it's interesting to to know that in that case, d plus one sample are again sufficient and also necessary actually. Okay, and these uh, if you want to have some details for for these two particular examples, you can look at the uh, recent paper that we have here that uh, not only uh, answers the question statistically, but also computationally, right? There's a, you know, very efficient ways to do that. Uh, but anyway, but I think that, the, you know, for the purposes of what we are asking before, here, these problems, we could agree that are easy to learn, right? Just because the number of samples I need is scales very gently with dimension, right? Just, uh, you know, uh, if I want to learn, let's say, things that live in, uh, that look like uh, images on, you know, in, on internet, you know, I have maybe a, a million, uh, like, you know, one megapixel. So with a small data set, you would already be able to learn all these things very well. Okay. But now let's, I mean, we could also agree that these kind of functions are not very interesting, right? We are just, uh, you know, these functions, they look at the high dimensional input. And the only thing that they do is that they project it into one direction, right? So it's like there's one hidden, hidden direction that just captures everything there is to know about this function, right? That's not typically uh, like that, that doesn't capture many functions of interest. And so now let's suppose that, uh, suppose now that F is only locally linear, right? Is, is locally linear, right? So instead of asking it to be linear in the whole domain, just on a little neighborhood, right? And so uh, the, what I mean by this is just formally that is a beta Lipschitz. Okay, so what I mean is that uh, f of x minus f of x prime is controlled by x minus x prime, right? And doesn't really matter the metric, right? Just think that everything is just in L, right? It's uh, Lipschitz with respect to the Euclidean distance. Okay. So Richard's functions, of course, are 
much more general than uh, linear functions, right? Because uh, uh, if, if you want to think about what does a Lipschitz, what is a Lipschitz function, just think that it's a function that has bounded derivatives everywhere. Morally, that's that's what the Lipschitz function does. And so now we can uh, uh, think about how our hypothesis space that contains Lipschitz functions, right? So we can actually uh, um, consider functions that are from R D to R, such that uh, F is bounded on Lipschitz. Okay. So it turns out that this is a is a Banach space, right? So this is a Uh, with norm is a, you can think that the norm is a, essentially a, the norm of F in that space is a, like the soup of the function plus the Lipschitz constant of the function. Okay, I didn't define the, what is the Lipschitz constant, but in this definition here, the Lipschitz constant of a, of a function F is the smallest beta that makes this equality, that makes this inequality true. Okay, so it's the smallest beta that you can plug in here so that this is true. Okay, so now um, <clears throat> again we have this picture that I that I draw before, where I have some points. X one, x two, x n, and I observe the value of the function at each of these points. And the only thing I know is that the function I'm looking for is uh, Lipschitz. So what is a reasonable uh, estimator for this problem? Okay, so uh, yeah, somebody's asking what is the Banach space? Yeah, Banach space is just a, a space that comes with an operation uh, that is the norm, right? So you can compute a norm to any element of that space, right? And the norm is this uh, function, if you want, that uh, has obeys this like, uh, you know, it's one degree homogeneous, non-negative, and has the triangular inequality. Doesn't matter. I mean, uh, just, just think that it's like a very natural way to compute complexity, right? I can, uh, I can, um, I can uh, actually, uh, you know, take a take a hypothesis and uh, and uh, you know assign its complexity, its norm, right? So here, that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna I'm gonna consider for this problem. The smoothest. Interpolate, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna estimate my my f star to be the arc mean over all my hypothesis space of what of the Lipschitz function, so the Lipschitz constant such that f of x i is equal to f star of x. So if you remember from uh, a few minutes ago, this is the ERM in interpolum four, right? So because I'm penalizing the complexity with the constraint that I want my, my estimator to go through the points. Makes, it, it's quite pretty natural as an estimator, right? You, you just, uh, you have observed some points and you say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try to fit the smoothest function that goes through the points. Okay, so so how good is this estimator? So how how do we think this estimator uh, approximates the target f star? Okay, so for for any x now, we can uh, bound the error as follows. So we're interested in how large is this error. Okay, so I have a just a picture here above. I have now a new point, you can draw it like this, like that's a new point that is just redrawn again. It's not in the training set. So I wanna compute the error of my estimator in that new point. So a very natural thing I can try to do is to somehow relate it to the closest training point I have, right? This is like a bit reminiscent to, you know, if you were thinking in terms of like nearest neighbor, right? Like nearest neighbor would be an, another very classical uh, estimator that would rely precisely on the same thing, right? Just uh, 
I query on the training set the point that was closest to X, and that's what the value I'm going to trust. Here, I do something a little bit more fancy, but the idea is the same. So now that we have this point, let's call this so let's call this point X, and let's call this point X. Let's call it uh, you know, let's call it uh, X I zero, right? That would be the point in my training set that is closest to X. So again, I'm going I'm doing the, the previous trick from before. I'm going to add and subtract the something that depends on this X I zero, and so uh, I'm going to do the follow. I'm just going to add and subtract these terms. And then apply the triangle inequality. Plus f star of x zero minus f star of x. Right. So I just add and subtract a bunch of points here. And so what can we say about let's say the second term? What is the value of this term? Zero, perfect, thank you. Right, it's zero because that's that's what I'm assuming here, right? So this this thing goes away. And now, what can I can I use my hypothesis? Right? Can I can I um, still control these two terms that I have here? Well, I know that f star is Lipschitz, and I know that uh, you know f star is Lipschitz, and I assume the, uh, the Lipschitz constant to be beta, right? So I know that this term here, the last term is control is upper bounded by beta times the distance, right? This distance here. Okay, so this uh, is gonna be uh, beta times x minus x i zero. So how about, this, how about the first term? Can I, can I say something about, what do I know about the Lipschitz constant of f hat? Do I know that it's, uh, do I know something about the Lipschitz constant of f hat? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, it cannot be bigger than beta. Why is that? Well, because I can already produce you one example, one function in the class that is f star that satisfies the constraints, right? So f star obviously satisfies this property. And so f star has a Lipschitz constant that is beta. So the meaning of this set has to cannot be bigger than beta, right? So I have something here that is two times beta x minus x is. Okay. And so if I now look at the population error, right? I have, a, now I think this implies that if I now take any point from my sample and I look at this squared error, I can control that by four beta squared. And then this expectation, right? It's an expectation of X over X and of course over the sample of this smallest distance that we have introduced here, right? So basically it's like on average, if I just draw the whole thing again, right? I draw n points IID from the Gaussian, I draw a new point X, and I look at the, how the distance, like the smallest distance from X to the nearest point behaves. So this is a quantity that might seem like a bit uh, uh, obscure, but in fact, uh, it has a very, uh, it, it corresponds to something quite uh, well understood, which is here the which is the Wasserstein distance, right? So if I think about the um, if I think about this a bit more generally, so I have the, this distribution uh, Gaussian distribution that we can call uh, you know, let's call it mu, and that the, the training set corresponds to an empirical sample from that, right? So the training set is uh, an empirical version of mu that is just uh, one over n a bunch of points that are drawn in Excel. So in fact, this is actually, um, uh, for constant, this is actually really, this is actually of the order of uh, the square of the distance between mu and mu n. Okay, so that's, um, we are not gonna, we are gonna describe a little bit more uh, in other lectures, uh, this, this distance, this object, this object will appear again when we will introduce dynamics in the space of measures. But for now, what you need to just, uh, you know, the, the hint here that it's in, where it's important is that this gives us a device to understand how this quantity that we care about behaves, right? As a function of the two things that matter, 
which is the n and the dimension. Okay, so this is a, this is a this is a distribution in dimension, and so we know that this is of the order of n to the minus one over d, right? And this really goes back to very classic works by uh, Dudley from the sixties, and uh, you know some improvements uh, when using more more general metrics are in this paper that by Bailey and others, right? Bailey and others, forty. Okay, but there's a, like, it's pretty well understood how this quantity behaves. So, um, as a consequence, if you want to get small error, small generalization error, how large, what is the sample complexity, right? So how large do we need to make N to make this thing uh, equal, like of the order of epsilon, right? So we need to basically, we want to make if, Epsilon has to be of the order of n to the minus one over d, right? What it what it what we need is that n has to grow like epsilon to the minus d. Okay. We can ensure uh, that we learn. Accuracy. So this is actually pretty bad, right? Because this is really a, a, a beware, right? So this is like a, a phenomena that we're referring at the title of the of this of this uh, section that is cursed by dimension. Okay, so what do we mean by that the, the rate is cursed by dimension? Well, we mean think that thing for a second. Uh, you give me uh, your prediction, I measure the error, and I say that you know you make an error, of, let's say 10%. And then I say, well, no, I'm not very happy. I want the error reduced by half. I, wanna, I, want, I want you to go back and reduce me error by half. So how, how many more data points do you need to do that, right? If you wanna you know, bring epsilon to reduce it by half, what you need is to multiply your training set by something that is exponential in dimension, right? Like the, the, you know, the, the number of new data points that you need to collect to ensure that has to grow exponentially, right? Like a two to the D, if you want to have a factor two in epsilon. So obviously this isn't, doesn't work, right? Because uh, uh, this theory is completely useless then in, to explain any practical success of these me learning methods. Just because these numbers are really, you know, two to the D, you can very quickly see that uh, when D is, let's say 40, 50, it's already a, a huge number, right? So imagine the one it's a million. So this is, doesn't really work. Uh, but of course, you can also argue that this is just a, a, it's a sufficient condition, right? Um, are we being too pessimistic? So in other words, is this, is this sample complexity also necessary? Okay, that we have this exponential dependency on dimension. And I just wanted to, to give you the um, kind of the flavor, like I, I'm not gonna be here very formal. I don't wanna spend too much time here, but I just gonna give you the intuition, right? That this dependency is necessary, is inherent to the fact that our hypothesis is just too large, right? There's too many Lipschitz functions in high dimension. So we can consider the box, right? So let's say just very simple construction, let's consider a box, I'm going to just do things a bit informally here. That is just the unit, the, you know, the unit cube, the unit box dimension, right? It's like a kind of a cube of length one dimension D. Okay, so it's a little box D. And now let's look at the function on B and the function Y that is defined in the interior of B or like in B to R that is just a uh, phi of X that is the distance from X to the boundary of B. Okay, so it's a, this, it's a function that measures for any point that is inside, what is the distance from, from X to the boundary? Okay, does it make sense? Okay, so, uh, so this function 
uh, just as a, maybe as an exercise, someone wants to do it during the break, is that phi is one Lipschitz, right? It's a Lipschitz function with con constant that is one. Okay, and of course it's a, it's a function that is localized in the inside. So now I'm gonna consider using this little template here, it's, think, of, think of it as a kind of a window, right? It's an indicator of that I'm inside the box, right? So now I'm gonna consider for each For each uh, corner in the hypercube, right? So I'm just again considering this structure. So now this is not no longer the like a you know like a field object, but it's just the corners of the hypercube. I'm just gonna draw it like this, maybe with a different color. Okay, so I have this. Okay, so that's the, the hypercube. So for any one of these corners, I'm gonna stick kind of a copy of this function, right? I'm gonna basically tile everything here. And in every corner of the hypercube, I'm gonna flip a sign, flip a coin. And that's the, the new function I'm gonna construct, right? Um, an arbitrary. sign that we can call this g of z that can be a plus or minus one, right? So basically every, at every corner of this hypercube, I flip a coin, right? And I, 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 I encode it here, g of z. Now I consider the function f star of x, that is the sum for all these points, let's call this thing the hypercube in dimension d of the translated uh, window uh, with the corresponding sign, right? So the picture, let's say in 2D, right? So if I have a picture in 2D, right? I would have uh, maybe, uh, you know, four copies of my little function. Sometimes this little function goes upwards, sometimes backwards, upwards, backwards, right? That would be like I flipping the sign, right? And I know that this function is localized, is zero in the boundary, right? And it's a uh, localized in D, right? So F is still one Lipschitz. and support it in a minus one, one to the D, right? Okay. So now let's say that, I, that, that your goal is to learn this function F star. Okay, so now you need to learn this function from some. And I claim, I claim, that if n, the number of samples, is much more than two to the d, then any estimator, right? It could be the one I presented before, it can be anything you want. Any estimator will incur a relative error. So basically the, on average, the relative error I'm gonna make divided by the norm of the function. This is gonna be of a constant order, right? So there's no way I can learn anything meaningful, right? So this error is gonna be, a, you know, um, essentially I'm gonna be as good as just a, predicting that the function is just zero everywhere. Okay. And I guess the intuition for, you know, the, the intuition that I would like to convey is that how many quadrants do we have in, in the hypercube, right? So how many, uh, you know, if I, if I tile this cube in dimension D, even if, just, if I tile it in chunks that are very massive, right? Just like half of it in each dimension, I already have like an exponential number of little cubes, right? And so, if I look at my data set, right? So I have, uh, you know, I have this in, in dimension D, right? And I have my Gaussian distribution, I sample points. So the point is that most of the quadrants are gonna be empty, right? There's, no, there's gonna be no data in most of the quadrants unless I have an exponential number of data points. And if I have no data in a quadrant, 
there's no way I can generalize, right? Because this function, the way I constructed it, has a completely independent bit per quadrant, right? So there's no way I can, uh, knowing the, the value of the function in one quadrant, figure out what is the value of the function in a different quadrant. So there's no generalization that is possible. Okay, so to summarize this, this block, um, We're going to take the break now. Um, what we have seen is that uh, linear functions uh, or let's say generalized linear function, right? In the, in the jargon of statistics, like a generalized linear model was this like a linear function that you pass through an activation function. What we need is that the sample complexity is of the order of t, right? For Lipschitz functions, uh, the sample complexity now is exponential in dimension. Okay, so this is a, in a sense easy, and this is impossible. So you might ask, uh, you know. Is there something in between, right? What is the, you know, we have been pretty brutal, right? In going from a function that is linear to a function that is Lipschitz. So yeah, in between, you have something, I don't know if here if there's people a bit more familiar, but you have, uh, of course, uh, mathematicians have uh, worked a lot in creating kind of a, a very rich landscape of different smoothness that the function can have, right? So in particular, you can imagine the Sobolev class. The Solev class, I can write it as a, here I'm gonna just use the S. These are just functions that go from RD to R. And again, the, the moral is the story is that F has S derivatives that are bounded, okay? Uh, bounded or in, you know, on, in, LP in more general definition, right? But the, for us, Lipschitz corresponded to the idea that there's one derivative that is bounded. So if you ask for more derivatives to be bounded, you are asking for more, right? You are basically making the function a little bit smoother and smoother and smoother. So for this problem, right? I'm not going to describe it here, but the sample complexity uh, is of the order of epsilon to the minus d plus 2s over s. Okay, and this is like a classic result from, uh, let's say, Tsibakov. So what it means is that uh, in this problem for this class, uh, you know, like uh, there's an effective dimension that is d to the s, right? And basically the idea is that if you have a, a Sobolev class with, uh, you know, s derivatives, it's like, okay, you are, you are changing d by d over s. Okay, so basically this is a uh, equivalent to epsilon to the minus d two, roughly. So, um, what it means is that unless s is of the order of d, no real change. Okay, so so in other words, if you have a uh, something that is, you know, uh, uh, epsilon to the minus one million or epsilon to the minus 100,000, it's the same thing, right? Like the, there's no, you know, if you just tell me that there's 10 derivatives that are finite, you are not changing anything at all about the course of dimensionality, right? Unless you start asking for number of derivatives, that is if the order of dimension. But there you are, you are again in, a, in trouble because uh, if you think for a second about a function that we care about, there's no way we can ask for so much smoothness, right? Like a uh, number of derivatives that is like of the order of a million doesn't make any sense in our context. Okay, uh, so the conclusion here before making a break is that we'll need to search for alternatives. Okay, so in other words, we need to look for different classes of functions, hypotheses that have maybe a better trade-off, right? That where, where we can, uh, you know, hope to learn them 
with a, a number of data points that is not exponential, but still have a bit more richness than just the linear structures. So we are gonna take a break now uh, of let's say uh, 10 minutes. Uh, and so we are gonna be uh, yeah, resuming in 10 minutes and then we are gonna uh, yeah, do the last part of the lecture. Okay, perfect. Joan, you have some questions. Yeah. Okay, yes, I see. Um, yeah, so if all derivatives are bounded, what does it mean? It means that your function is um, very, very, very smooth, right? So think about what I think about when I think about the function that is like in C infinity, I typically think about the Gaussian, right? It's like a, a window that, you know, uh, has no, no discontinuities whatsoever. Um, of course, it uh, you know there's a uh, you know a formal you know you can formally define a, um, you can characterize functions that have all derivatives bounded through many many different ways and you know I'm not really an expert but for example if you have like functions that are analytic they are uh, have all the derivatives are bounded polynomials also have this property etc etc etc. Okay, there's a question about where can we find the references for papers. Uh, good question. I can uh, we can try to create um, add it onto the web the website of the course. Uh, we had we had put like two main references, but we can also put like further references. But uh, yeah, I mean all these things are uh, pretty like uh, classic textbooks on high dimensional statistics. Uh, you can find those there. Uh, so just on the you know on memory you can look at Sibakov um, uh, 08. That's a very good reference. Um, then there's also Wainwright uh, team. So these are like books, right? The uh, high dimensional statistics. Um, and then uh, yeah, and then there's um, um, for the second part that we are going to see, we are going to use also some material that is available online. Okay. So now we are gonna uh, start discussing, we're gonna discuss uh, a bit more detail how neural networks can enter into this picture. And we are gonna start with the particularly simple family of neural networks, which are the ones that have a single hidden layer. We call them shallow. Okay, so for this, we are going to just define what is this class. So consider some real valued <coughs> real activation function that is just, I'm assuming that it's going to be Lipschitz. Um, actually, this is not really need, needed, so I'm just going to just forget about this. Uh, and then we defined our uh, function, <coughs> defined over, over RD that has some parameters and this function can be written as a linear combination of what we call uh, rich functions. Okay, so here X is in RD. A, K are in RD, and B, K, and C, K are in R. Okay, so the parameters of the network are capturing all these quantities. <coughs> all right. So in, in, in a sense, it's really uh, starting from you, you can argue, you, you, can, you can use the intuition that we have built a little bit at the beginning where linear functions are very easy to learn, but they're very simple. Uh, if I add a, a nonlinear activation function on top of a linear function, I convince you that it's still like relatively easy to learn, at least in terms of some complexity, but still relatively simple. So this model now just tries to say, okay, let's, let me just 
combine a bunch of these things, a bunch of like, uh, and this is what's called um, in analysis, it's called a ridge function. Okay, a ridge, because um, uh, I'm not very good at drawing, but the idea is that if you think about like geology, right, like a ridge is some kind of like a, something that you see in a, in a, you know, maybe like a mountain, right? It's like a, something that uh, suddenly falls off, right? Falls off a cliff. So a ridge function is just uh, something that this, that something like this in high dimensions, where the direction of the ridge is uh, parameterized by, by, by this direction. And then maybe the, like the height of the ridge is the CK and then the, you know, the offset of the ridge is the B bias. Okay. And so now we can, uh, we can collect all of these functions and pack them into whole space, right? So like the space functions represented with shallow neural networks. Okay, is, you can write it like this, is the set that I just collect all the possible functions that I can write by all the possible choices of parameters and uh, by looking at all the possible widths, right? So I'm just looking at the, at the linear span in the function space of bridge functions. Okay. And so a natural question uh, that was, in a sense, uh, even in the very, very early days of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning was already asked, is how expressive is this set? Okay, so what can we represent with this? Uh, with this class of hypothesis. So you might be, uh, I guess, familiar with this uh, notion of universal approximation. Okay, so universal approximation is, uh, again, in words, what does it mean? It means that if I have some, fun like for any function of interest that the, the world might be throwing at me, I know that my family of functions is sufficiently rich that it can approximate this target as well as I want, right? Like I have this capacity to approximate any function that the nature throws at me, right? So this is really a, a, like in a bit more formal terms is that um, if, so basically that uh, we got like, a, um, so for a given, metric D that is defined over continuous functions. Uh, we'd like is that for every continuous function and for every error tolerance that, I, that, that, that you want exists, some network that is in my class, such that D of F and F tilde is smaller than F. Okay, so that's what we, that we meant by saying that this class has universal approximation, right? Of course, it's relative to what we mean by this distance, right? And we are gonna discuss this a little bit now. Okay, and so to get intuition, just to see it like uh, to see it once done in a way that is maybe a you know without relying on complicated like or powerful mathematical concepts. Let's try to get uh, an intuition by looking at the three-layer approximation, right? So to get intuition, I'm going to slightly change the problem. I'm kind of cheating a little bit. I'm going to use an, one extra hidden layer. Then we are going to go back and, and, and look at it again at this class. Okay, so let us first consider a three layer approximation. Okay, and so what we are going to 
what we're going to show now is that if you have any function that is continuous, and uh, and let me also just uh, maybe <coughs> uh, some epsilon and zero, and then let's let me just focus on an approximation in a compact domain, right? So I'm just again using a cube here to to localize things. Okay, so that's the domain, and uh, let this delta be bigger than like some delta, so that when x minus x prime is smaller than delta. Um, in infinity norm for x and x prime in the domain, then g of x minus g of x prime is more than s. Okay, this I can always find it because the function is continuous. Then there exists a three layer. Uh, value network F with a number of uh, parameters that is uh, at most delta to the minus D and uh, such that F minus G in L1 norm is smaller than X. Okay, so just to to agree on what this theorem says in words, it means that if I have a continuous function, I can approximate it arbitrarily well in the L1 norm. So this is like, a, this is L1 over omega, right? So I can approximate it arbitrarily well in this domain, like a compact domain. I'm using here the Q, but it's arbitrary, right? Any compact domain. And I can do it, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to do it constructively, right? And so, um, yeah, there's one thing that uh, already uh, you you should uh, you should realize, and that it's somehow consistent with the description that we that we were saying before the break. Continuous functions like this G, I'm assuming very little about G, right? I'm just saying that the function is continuous. As I said, continuous and Lipschitz are morally uh, equivalent, right? So like the you know the the number of continuous functions, the number of Lipschitz functions is broadly in the same order. And so before we saw that it was very hard, like, uh, you know, it was very expensive to identify a Lipschitz function. Here, what this result says is that it's gonna be also very expensive to approximate it with this class that we have, right? In the sense that here, you might uh, identify again a dependency, right? Like before it was the sample complexity. Right? How many samples we need to observe to approximate something with error, like to learn a function with some error. Here, it's has it's the same curse, but appears in a different flavor. Which is now I'm gonna I want to try to approximate this function class with a with a parametric space, right? That has different number of units, right? So here the number of units that I need is also has the same flavor of being a, has this very bad exponential dependency on dimension. Okay. So we are gonna, uh, I'm sorry, this is a, there's a factor two here. Um, okay, so uh, for the proof, I'm, I'm gonna, so this is a kind of a classic result, but here I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna follow the, just give you the main element and it, I'm following my, the, you know, the notes of uh, Markus Telgarski from his class um, from last year, okay? I really recommend that you take a look at these um, lecture notes, which are very nice. I think it's there link linked on the website, but if not, we're gonna do that. Uh, okay, so it uses a, so we are gonna, it's, you will say that it's not very complicated, but as opposed to what will come next, it's a very constructive proof, right? We are gonna actually build a network ourselves. So for this, we are gonna first use a, some inter intermediate result that we are not gonna prove, but I think it's the kind of results that it's, you know, everyone will agree that uh, it's just a mechanical question, right? There's no, there's no idea that it's, uh, you know, that is lurking inside. And so we are going to consider any, uh, so any subset of R D 
<coughs> and let me consider a compact and uh, with a partition. Um, P of U into rectangles. Okay, so P contains a bunch of rectangles, R1 to Rn, and each rectangle, or think about like a like a cube, if you want, like a hypercube. Um, each um, with lengths that are not uh, bigger than delta. Okay, so in pictures, I have my domain U, if you want, uh, and then I just uh, slice it in all directions. <coughs> okay, so I have a kind of a partition of this into different rectangles. Then there exist the scalars, alpha one, alpha n, that satisfy that the uniform error of x with h of x is smaller than epsilon with h being a piecewise constant approximation. And this is just the indicator Okay, so basically this, in other words, this waste of an approximation has small errors uh, provided uh, pieces are sufficiently small. Okay, that's kind of intuitive, right? If I have a function that is continuous, I can uh, approximate it by uh, something that is piecewise constant. And the error I'm gonna make is gonna decrease uh, by the smaller the, 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 the pieces are, right? Just because the, the, the function is continuous. All right, <clears throat> so we are just gonna you know, assume that this is done. And, and of course, the, the size of this partition will be of the order of delta to the minus d, right? Like the, the size of p here is of the order of delta to the minus d. Okay? Think about uh, you have a unit cube and you want to cap it into small chunks, small cubes of length delta. So the number of, uh, you just argue in terms of volume, right? The, the volume of each of these things is delta to the min, delta to the D and the total volume is one. So the number of cubes that you need is of the order of delta to the minus D. Okay, so now we are gonna have a, like, let's, let's, um, let P, the partition from that we just described, from above. Um, of, um, of u and I'm gonna consider u to be, let's say zero and then it's like a one plus c for any arbitrary constant c, right? I'm just gonna take the, the hypercube and just make it as a, like put a little bit of boundary. That doesn't really, doesn't really change anything. Into rectangles. Okay, and let me, let me the rectangles, each of the rectangles, I can write it as a product of intervals, okay, with bj minus aj smaller than that, okay, like the size of the rectangles are small. And then, of course, we can look at the define the, the the approximation that comes with the with the lemma, which is like this piecewise linear approximation, piecewise constant approximation. Right, so we know that uh, g minus h in L1 norm is smaller than epsilon. 
So now our model, we will construct a network that will be of the form, of the form f of x, the sum over i of alpha i. And you know, this function that's this like indicator of the rectangle is not really, it doesn't look like a neuron, right? So what we're gonna do is just gonna try to approximate this little indicator with a neural network, right? So we are gonna construct a network, an approximation that has this property. Okay, so uh, where each GI is a value network that approximates the indicator of each. Okay, so that's really like the main idea of this of this proof that is constructive, is that I take an arbitrary continuous function, I chop it into very small pieces, uh, so that I can define this piecewise constant approximation, and then I'm just gonna uh, you know spend my my time trying to uh, approximate the indicator of a square of a rectangle in the dimensions with a neural net, right? Which is it seems more like a it's it, now now the problem is starting to look tractable, right? Because now I just need to, you know, to play a little bit with uh, with the activation function, and you're also gonna see that this comes quite naturally. Okay. So, uh, and, and just to see how the mechanism will work, right? Is that uh, if this, you know, if each of the GI has a good approximation with Ri, that do we, do we preserve the good approximation of the function, right? So we know that, uh, you know, at the end, what we want is this thing to be small, right? But again, by using the, the triangular inequality, uh, we know that this is, um, we introduce our piecewise constant approximation plus the difference in G. Right, so that was the original error. This is small from the lemma. And this is the error that now we need to, to figure out how to make it small. Right, but this we can just break it into the sum over i of alpha i, and then this is just the error between the indicator function and uh, gi plus epsilon. And so this is uh, controlled by the absolute value of the alpha i's times the L1 norm. Right, so you see where this is going, right? So if, if we can approximate or we can build GI so that this error is smaller, small uh, against the sum, then we are Done, right, because this thing then will be uh, two times epsilon as claimed. Okay, so <clears throat> if we look at this problem um, now, we can now we can just uh, you know as again uh, argue like convince ourselves that this is indeed possible, right? That we can express we can write as a rect an indicator of a rectangle with neural networks. So for this, I'm gonna just uh, focus on one of the rectangles, right? The rest is, is, uh, is uh, analogous. So we fix I, right? We fix one rectangle and, uh, and let the rectangle, the corresponding rectangle Ri to be of the form, uh, let me write it like this. It's a product of intervals, right? So I'm just dropping the index uh, I here, okay? And now I'm just gonna uh, introduce a like a parameter that is free parameter, gamma. Um, and then for each coordinate, that is in one to D, I consider the following. Gamma J, right? So it's like a one little um, network for a coordinate that is just gonna be this 
value activation function that is parameterized uh, as follows. So I add this value, I subtract this value. I subtract this value. And I add this value. Okay, so, so just to, to visualize what we are aiming for, right? If we are slicing the rectangle in one coordinate, that's our rectangle with AJ and AJ. And now we are, where we are introducing, we are introducing uh, some gamma, like some slack. Right, and so what, what, what if someone can, uh, and these are, these are values, eh? so like a phi of t is just the max of zero and t. Right, so if someone uh, can look at this formula, maybe you can infer what this function that we are learning is trying to do, right? Uh, approximating so what this g, g gamma j is doing. So it's a function that is zero, right? When z is smaller than any of these things, right? Uh, all the values are gonna be killed, right? And active. And so when I, when I arrive here, there's one neuron that starts to go up, right? So it goes up a bit up until I'm here. When I'm when z is larger than aj, basically the two values here kill each other, right? And you actually and they have a separation of one, so basically that's a thing that you see going here. And then uh, when I'm when I, when z goes after bj, you have the opposite effect, right? It goes down like this, and then it goes to this. okay. So that's what this function g gamma j is doing. Okay, so you can see, of course, that uh, because gamma is arbitrary, right? I can make this these two functions uh, arbitrarily close to each other. Yeah, by making gamma very small. And so now this is something that I have coordinate by coordinate. So the last step is how do I construct a function that lives in the high dimensional space, right? So now from last step, right, is that how to aggregate all these little functions. That's why I need an extra layer. Right, that's why I need an extra layer because I'm just going to take the value of the sum for all, for all j of assuming every coordinate minus d minus one. Okay, so basically what, I, what, what this function is doing is that this function, so we can verify that now, if you look at this uh, in, in several dimensions, right? Let me just do it in two dimensions, right? Just so that we can uh, get an intuition of what's happening. Right? So this function, um, dj, is going to be um, zero outside, right? Because I'm, uh, I'm going to basically, the only place, the only possibility that this thing inside, right? So this term inside, for this thing to be non-zero, this sum needs to be bigger than d plus one, than d minus one, right? So it means that I need to actually be inside the rectangle, uh, uh, you know, um, I need to be at, inside the rectangle at least d times, right? So this thing is gonna be uh, zero outside, it's gonna be one inside, and it's gonna be something in between, right? Uh, in the transition. And again, the size of this transition, right, is of the order of gamma. Okay, so what we verify is that there are two things, is that uh, g gamma of x is one if x is in the rectangle, is zero if x is not in the kind of augmented rectangle, right, let's call this thing like this. Um, aj minus gamma, dj plus gamma, and then it's gonna be in between otherwise. And the other thing, of course, that we can verify, thanks to this, is that the norm, the other one norm between this function and the uh, uh, indicator of the rectangle, obviously, 
I can make this error as small as I want. How can I make this error as small as I want? By changing gamma, right? Making gamma very small. So this in fact is the, of the order of gamma. Okay, and so, so what we have shown in a way that is like pretty constructive is that in fact, it's not so hard to take any continuous function and write it as a net, as a neural net, approximate it as a neural net, right? The only thing that is slightly uh, not satisfactory here is that we're using two hidden layers, right? There's one, there's one hidden layer that we use for each of the coordinates, and then another hidden layer that we use to kind of aggregate the, 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 aggregate the result uh, into, um, into something that basically we, yeah, into aggregate the result and then transform the result, right? So these two, this construction seems to require two layers. So as you might know, right? Um, so just a remark. So are the two layers, the two hidden layers, necessary? Um, well, I can maybe remark a question. So here we use them because it's, you know, it gave you like a very constructive proof, but in fact, <clears throat> the answer is no. Hell no. Okay. Um, and in fact, there's a, there's a very simple route to, 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 to show that this uh, is, it was a little bit uh, sloppy, right? That there's, there's, a, there's a much more direct way to do it. Um, and for this, we can uh, uh, recall sort of a classic result in um, um, a classic result in a polynomial approximation. It's a classic result in a polynomial approximation that just then very seamlessly extends much more general. And this is the theorem by the stone bias trust here, right? And, and, and that uh, uh, maybe uh, most of you are familiar with, right? Is that uh, if I have some domain again, that I just decide to be uh, for convenience, this unit cube. And so um, let uh, any uh, capital F be a function class So this fine that each F is continuous. Then I need to ensure that I can find functions that are non-zero, right? So for any point in my set, there exists a function in my family such that f of x is non-zero. And then I also need the ability to separate points for any pair of different points. Exists a function that separates them. And last but not least, that f is an algebra. So what it means is that it's closed under multiplication and uh, kind of vector scalar vector space operations. Okay, so multiplying by a scalar and adding things. Okay, and so what is the theorem? Uh, if this thing satisfied, then f. Uh, enjoys universal approximation. Okay, so basically it means that um, any continuous G can be um, um, well approximated, right? So uh, any continuous G and uh, 
for any epsilon, there exists F in the family with uniform error that is bounded by epsilon. Okay, so this is like a, um, a very powerful, very general result, right? Of course, polynomial systems are an algebra, right? So like if you multiply polynomials, you get, an, you get another polynomial. And, and somehow you can see why this is the thing that was, was missing in the previous proof, right? Because in the previous proof, we, we started by trying to approximate this, like um, each of the uh, projections of the rectangle with a simple Rayleigh network. And then of course, if you have this approximation and you multiply indicator functions for every coordinate, you get the rectangle, right? The rectangle is separable. So if, if somehow someone would tell us that uh, if you can, uh, if you take two uh, functions, two shallow networks, and you consider their, their point-wise multiplication is also shallow network, then we would be done, right? Because the previous construction would work directly. So this in a sense is what, uh, what, uh, what was done, right? Like the, the most of the effort in the 80s and 90s to establish these universal approximation theorems was really through this uh, stone bias stress theorem, right? So for example, uh, so, so in other words, this theorem can be used to, to establish this universal approximation theorem for general, for very general, for, sorry, um, for our model, uh, uh, with general choices of sigma. Okay, so just an example, um, sigma, that is the sigmoidal. So what it means is that the sigma, uh, any activation function that is continuous and uh, uh, satisfies that lim uh, when t goes to minus infinity of this is zero, and then a lim uh, when t goes to plus infinity of sigma t equals one. This, this model satisfies the assumptions of, of stone Weierstrass. So you have the universal approximation and that was established by uh, Hornick et al. in uh, 89. And then uh, sigma that is not a polynomial also satisfies these properties. as was shown by Lesnar in 93. Okay, so, okay. So now the conclusion is that indeed this, uh, you know, these shallow networks can approximate any continuous function. Uh, question that I might ask here is that, uh, is this surprising? And of course, another question is that are are the approximation rates um, first using again this model? Okay, so we want to understand uh, again. Not only, uh, you know, we as as we have been motivating uh, in the beginning of this lecture, we are not just happy to have a system where you can make the approximation error zero as the complexity goes to infinity, right? This is what this universal approximation tells us, right? Right now we have been just, uh, we have not been quantifying, right? What do we ask? What is the complexity that we ask in this hypothesis to approximate, right? We have just uh, been concerned with the, the existence of one function in the class that has good approximation, right? So we wanna try to understand some, something a bit more quantitative. And so this will be my last uh, 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 vignette from today. Uh, so we are gonna try to you know, bring a little bit these questions home by looking at the, at the Fourier perspective. That somehow illuminates a little bit you know, why this is happening and somehow shows that we have not done much, right? We, I mean, and these results are somehow still uh, just mi minor extensions from you know the, the structure that comes from Fourier analysis. So 
for this, we can just, uh, and I believe that Sebastia is going to talk a little bit about um, her uh, Fourier transforms later in the class. Uh, in the Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's one lecture where we're going to do some um, some uh, background on uh, on Fourier, etc. So uh, I'm going to just here very go be pretty pretty brief, uh, and uh, I guess for any questions we'll have more chance in the later lectures to uh, to expand. So here I'm just going to think about like a, again look at the function that is continuous, uh, and we consider its restriction again to a compact to a compact uh, domain. to a compact omega again can be uh, this uh, interval that we have been using so far all right so there's one uh, uh, powerful thing that we can do is that just think that you have this you know just your domain that is a like a d-dimensional domain that looks like this thing and you have like a, some function that is living in there so for this problem, uh, we know that uh, there's a very uh, uh, equivalent way to represent the function uh, using frequencies, right? So uh, for any vector of frequencies that are just integer frequencies, we can consider it's uh, what we call it's Fourier decomposition. that is just going to be given by the dot product of f with uh, this uh, oscillating function, right? And, and here I'm being a little bit um, sloppy in the normalization, right? So I'm just uh, assuming that this is just, uh, you know, it's the, the integral over the domain of f of x e to the uh, minus i x psi dx, okay? So, and, and just again, in terms of, um, um, right, think about the diagram, uh, you know, in, in the line, right, you would get, uh, you know, like a Fourier decomposition is like a Fourier series that just has one, one number or frequency, right, that would be in 1D. In 2D, you have, a, you know, your frequency domain is the grid of 2D frequencies, right? So in the, in the dimensions, think that you have a, something like this, right? You have a, like a lattice of integer frequencies and this uh, uh, represents your function, right? In this compact domain. But most importantly, we have a way to go back, right? We can reconstruct the function from Fourier coefficients, right? And so um, what we know is that um, you have a Fourier inversion, right? Uh, lemma, that says that uh, if I look at the truncated function, right? So um, if I consider fm of x, that we take the sum of all the frequencies that are in a radius r. So like, you know, there might be like a, a number of frequencies that fall into this, into this ball. And I'm just gonna take the function, record, try to reconstruct the function by just sticking together So basically, linear combination of uh, of um, waves like of uh, sinusoids, where the coefficients are precisely the you know the decomposition coefficient of f, right? So this thing and here m, so m uh, is uh, the number of frequencies inside um, you know, this. This ball. Okay. So what we know is that this, as m goes to infinity, this converges to f, right? In L2. As m or you know, r goes to infinity, right? So if you, if you make the radius bigger and bigger and bigger and you collect all the frequencies, this converges to the function, right? And this is because you are just relying on the fact that there's a very natural uh, control, right? So there's a 
so in particular, let's look at this. Well, let's look at what this formula says, right? So if you if you look at this function, right? Um, for those of you who are not familiar, you know, e to the i x theta, right? Is a, just a very simple. It's a one particular choice of a of an activation function, right? With sigma of t, the complex exponential, right? Which is just the cosine of t plus i times sine of t. Okay, it's it might be uh, you know maybe not as standard as the ReLU, but it's just an activation function, right? It just maps r to r, uh, and so here what we have is just a, a neural network, if you want. Uh, so this is a so fm is a is a is a shallow neural network with m periodic ne periodic neurons. Okay, so this has exactly the form of a shallow neural network, okay? And so we have a very tight control, right? So, so we know many things about uh, how fast this, this approximation converges to the function, right? So we have a, we have very tight control over uh, so uh, of how the regularity of f uh, inf influences the decay of f hat, right? As this grows. Okay, so if you are not familiar, if what I'm saying here is, sounds like a, you know, very unfamiliar territory, um, I will refer you to some very kind of classic references on the on the topic, but this uh, this dichotomy right be between uh, how to measure smoothness of a function uh, and express this as some form of decay over some representation that's kind of a fundamental. I mean, it goes of course far beyond machine learning, far beyond. I mean, it's really a, a kind of one of the the fundamental reasons why we have analysis. And so um, yeah, so here in particular. We can uh, we can recover effortlessly the this kind of quantitative version of universal approximation, right? Universal approximation is just a, a corollary, right? Uh, after you know just understanding the Fourier inversion lemma, and moreover, we can go back to our Sobolev class, right? So like uh, if this is Sobolev, so Sobolev has a very again we can rely on this dichotomy, right? And understand that Sobolev functions. Are precisely those that have a certain decay, right? And so, obviously, if I look at the function here, and my Fourier decomposition decay is very fast, I will be able to have small error by keeping by keeping a smaller number of frequencies, right? I'm just going to truncate the radius, right, uh, up to a certain error. So, like the faster the decay, the smaller the approximation error. And so, this is really uh, quantified here that if f is in sub left, right, then this uh, rate of approximation. Right, is of the order of m to the minus s over d, right? And this is something that uh, that is classic, right? So this is a uh, uh, you know again you can look at Sivakov, but I'm pretty sure that there's uh, many other uh, analyses like uh, you know the war also, etc., who have this kind of result. All right, so this again. Uh, exhibits a curse of dimensionality, right? Again, in approximation. So really this, this uh, tool of trying to control, uh, you know, like try to pack a lot of information about the function with small number of coefficients, this doesn't play well in high dimensions, right? Just because, you know, uh, this notion of regularity Already require. I mean, the, everything I need to compress, I need to pay an exponential price in dimension. And so, uh, just as a as a as a final uh, uh, um, snippet, how can we overcome this curse? So, is there some other uh, characterization we can do, even in the Fourier domain, that would, you know, enable an efficient approximation? Okay, and so remember that uh, I, I want to remind you 
about of this kind of inversion formula, right? Like that we have a, um, and, and again, writing it again. Um, so like, let's draw again the, the, the Fourier representation, like a Fourier representation. Okay, so, so if, I, if I just now write it in a bit more um, um, abstract way, right? So uh, in, um, so in, in L1, right? It's like I just replaced the sums by integrals, but the idea is that they have uh, a hat is again the integral of f x of i and psi. And then I can go back under certain conditions, right? Um, okay. And so the intuition here is that uh, if this, if I, if I look at this uh, representation, right? Think of this as a like how spread is this function in Fourier? So somehow, if the function was not very spread in Fourier, I should be able to uh, extract like a, to have good approximation by picking the largest elements, right? By just uh, you know instead of uh, you know, I have my representation, I can draw it in Fourier by just you know illustrating which are the frequencies where. Uh, f hat is, is largest, right? I can maybe just select the frequency that was largest and maybe I can get good approximation. Like that. And so the, the intuition that I'm writing here is that instead of looking at, so, so if you think it in these terms, the relevant quantity that matters is not so much the, you know, like the decay as the frequencies go, but th there's maybe something that you can extract directly from the Fourier transform. And this is really like this idea that if you ha have, happen for a second that the Fourier transform is an integrable is in L1, right? So if this thing is finite, yes, and this is just a, F1 is just a, the sum of the absolute value. Okay, so instead of actually asking for the Fourier coefficients to decay very quickly, now I'm just, I'm asking these things to be integrable, right? So if this thing is integrable, then what? Then the idea is that if I go back here, I can try to, to think about this representation in terms of computing an expectation. Okay, so the fact that I have now a norm that instead of looking at something that looks like a sobolev, which is like very generally related to derivatives and L2, something that is integrable, then I can find a way out. Okay, and I'm, I'm just gonna show you that and then we can conclude. Okay, and just, uh, what is the idea? Okay, the idea is gonna be a bit more general, but, but, but it's really related to, to this norm. Okay, so the idea that again, I'm gonna write f of x a bit more generally by, by just uh, you know, replacing these Fourier atoms by something a bit more general. Let, let, let me assume that I have um, a representation of this form with G that is integral. Okay, so the norm, the L1 norm of G is fine. All right, so now I'm gonna do a trick. I'm gonna write G of W as the sine of G of W times the L1 norm of G times the absolute value of G of W divided by the L1 norm of G of W, okay? And I'm gonna call this Q of W. So what are the properties of Q? So Q is not negative, right? Because I'm just looking at the absolute value. And what is the integral of Q? I don't know if uh, I lost everyone, but- One. One, thank you, right? Because I'm normalizing it, right? So Q is a probability density, right? So 
Okay, so now I'm gonna go back and write f of x as the sigmoid from before times the sine of g of w times, so the other one norm goes, goes outside, this is just a constant, times q of w dw, yes? So this becomes an expectation over q of these objects here. Yeah, I can call this, if you want, I can call it um, X and W. So how do you approximate an expectation with finite number of neurons? Okay, so this is really an expectation over the parameter space, right? So how do you approximate such a function? How do you approximate an expectation? Well, there's not much thing, right? You can just draw a sample from the distribution. Good, thank you. Okay, so you just say, I'm gonna pick an, I'm gonna approximate with M samples by just doing an empirical average and then equals one to M of this function, right? Phi of X, WI, where now WI are drawn from Q, IAD. Okay, and what is the error that I make here? between F and FM. So this is nothing else than the Monte Carlo estimator, right? Okay, so the, again, by using a elementary properties, again, we are, we are averaging functions that are drawn IID, right? We know that this uh, is squared error. I can, uh, I can now uh, decompose it in, term, in terms of like the moments of these new units, right? So I can just write it as um, an expectation over, over the theters of the Q of the expectation over X of phi of X or U squared uh, with some norm that I just forgot here, the square norm divided by M, right? Because again, it's like when I average, when I average M functions that are drawn IID, the variance is just the, the variance of each term divided by M, okay? And so now I can just turn out that this thing, in fact, is just uh, uh, controlled by the L1 norm squared, and I can maybe just take the soup over my parameters of this uh, expectation over X, divided by M, okay? And so now here, what is the dimensionality of the problem, right? Like think about these uh, activation functions here. You know, if this is like the complex exponential, this is like, uh, you know, phi is always controlled by one, right? In the case of Fourier, right? So this quantity, you know, the, the, the key driver of this quantity is this norm, right? So here there's no curse of dimensions, right? Like a curse of dimensionality is avoided, of course, provided that G is fine. Okay, and so here, of course, I just tried to give you the main idea. Uh, this thing was observed by this very nice paper from Baron, Andrew Baron, in 93, that, uh, you know, instead of using uh, this complete, this strange activation function that is the Fourier atom, you can you can make it practical. You can you can relate it to classical activation functions, right? And for this, you just need to change a little bit this definition of L1 norm of the Fourier. So we just uh, um, the last thing. So you define a norm that's L1 norm of the instead of being the L1 norm of the Fourier transform of f, it's the L1 norm of the gradient of the of the function. I like the Fourier transform of the gradient, okay, which is um, 
for those of you who know, this is a kind of a weighted L1 norm. Okay, so assume that this thing is finite uh, with both F and F hat in L1. Then we can approximate F with um, two accuracy epsilon with your favorite neurons with maybe like value or sigmoid uh, uh, units with a number of units that is proportional to C times to the epsilon squared, okay? So here there's no course. Okay, so the, the rate is dimension free, right? So like everything is encapsulated in the fact that this norm is small. Of course, that the, 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 the main, uh, you know, the, the main, uh, main question, right? Is when, why is C finite, right? Um, so in other words, is C, uh, let's say, small, right? Because of course, if this, if this object, if C is like an exponentially large in dimension, this doesn't really help us, right? So, so the main question that we are going to uh, discuss a little bit in another lecture is to, to take it from here, right? So, so uh, you know, do not, do not read, do not interpret that this result says that uh, shallow neural networks are everything you need. Right, that uh, you know you can get good approximation, good generalization with shallow neural networks. Right, that's with this very big uh, caveat, very big assumption that it's only when this object here, when this norm is small. All right. So um, yeah. So just as a as a conclusion, right? Just to, to wrap it up. Conclusions like uh, take home is that uh, learning in high dimensions. Officially uh, requires new function spaces, right? That are going to be adapted to the physics, to the physical world, if you want, right? So, so far, everything that we have just said is a high dimensional space that has no structure, right? And so we need to, we'll need to actually dig a little bit deeper into the, the role of physics in this, in learning, right? So like images, sounds, etc. Okay, so we are gonna see this in the next lectures. So yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I'll, I guess the uh, next Tuesday is Sebastia who takes over and next Thursday as well, right? You have now a, a batch of three lectures that are given, going to give by Sebastian. Yes, uh, there is one remaining question from the first hour by Valkyrup Sangapta. Yes, is the result of Sivakov a consequence of Sobolev embedding theorem? Uh, I guess by embedding theorem, you mean that you can embed Sobolev spaces into each other so that there's some inclusion. Uh, yeah, here you need uh, something a bit more, right? And, and, and um, the thing that I described here by using the Fourier representation should give you like a good indication of uh, why this thing works, right? So, so when you have, um, when you want to understand the, the benefit of the you know, der number of derivatives that are there, you typically typically go you do like integrate integration by parts, right? So, so every time that you can ask for one more derivative, you can actually uh, you know, do integral by parts and see that you need to essentially uh, approximate one less dimension somehow. Uh, and so, um, yeah. Um, but I think, I mean, it's, it's definitely related, but there's a little bit more to that. Okay. Well, as John said, uh, next week on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, the session will be on learning by means of kernels technically 
they're producing a Hel uh, kernel Hilbert spaces. And on Thursday, about learning by means of uh, stochastic gradient descent, or in general, uh, gradient descent, but particularly stochastic gradient descent. Okay. Have a good bye day, bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Johan.